In September and subsequently October of 2013, the Republican Party and its Tea Party extremists in Congress vowed to create budgetary and fiscal crises if the Democratic Party didn't gut health care reform and submit to a host of other right-wing demands. But Robert Perry writes that a driving force in this craziness is an anti-historical view of the Constitution. On September 28, 2013, he wrote the following. As the world ponders why the American right, through its Tea Party power in Congress, is threatening to shut down the federal government and precipitate a global economic crisis by defaulting on U.S. debt, the answer goes to the self-image of these rightists who insist they are the true defenders of the founding principles. This conceit is reinforced by the vast right-wing media via talk radio, cable TV, well-funded internet sites, and a variety of books and print publications. Thus the Tea Partiers, and many Republicans, have walled themselves off from the actual history which would show the American right to be arguably the opposite of true patriots, actually the faction of U.S. politics that has most disdained and disrupted the orderly constitutional process created in 1787. Indeed, the history of the American right can roughly be divided into four eras, the pre-Confederate period from 1787 to 1860, when slave owners first opposed and then sought to constrain the Constitution, viewing it as a threat to slavery, the actual Confederacy from 1861 to 1865, when the South took up arms against the Constitution in defense of slavery, the post-Confederate era from 1866 to the 1960s, when white racists violently thwarted constitutional protections for blacks, and the neo-Confederate era from 1969 to today, when these racists jumped to the Republican Party in an attempt to extend white supremacy behind various code words and subterfuges. It is true that the racist right has often moved in tandem with the wealthy elite right, which has regarded the regulatory powers of the federal government as a threat to the ability of rich industrialists to operate corporations and to control the economy without regard for the larger public good. But the historical reality is that both the white supremacists and the anti-regulatory corporatists viewed the Constitution as a threat to their interests because of its creation of a powerful central government that was given a mandate to promote the general welfare. The Constitution was far from perfect, and its authors did not always have the noblest of motives, but it created a structure that could reflect the popular will and be used for the nation's good. The key framers of the Constitution, the likes of George Washington, James Madison, who was then a protege of Washington, Alexander Hamilton, and Governor Morris, who wrote the famous preamble, were what might be called pragmatic nationalists, determined to do what was necessary to protect the nation's fragile independence and to advance the country's economic development. In 1787, the Framer's principal concern was that the existing government structure, the Articles of Confederation, was unworkable because it embraced a system of strong states deemed sovereign and independent, and a weak central government called simply a League of Friendship among the states. The Constitution flipped that relationship, making federal law supreme and seeking to make the states subordinately useful, in Madison's evocative phrase. Though the Constitution did make implicit concessions to slavery in order to persuade Southern delegates to sign on, the shift toward federal dominance was immediately perceived as an eventual threat to slavery. Key anti-federalists, such as Virginia's Patrick Henry and George Mason, argued that over time the more industrial North would grow dominant and insist on the elimination of slavery and it was known that a number of key participants at the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia, including Benjamin Franklin and Alexander Hamilton, were strongly in favor of emancipation, and that Washington also was troubled by human bondage, though a slaveholder himself. So, Henry and Mason cited the threat to slavery as their hot-button argument against ratification. In 1788, Henry warned his fellow Virginians that if they approved the Constitution, it would put their massive capital investment in slaves in jeopardy. Imagining the possibility of a federal tax on slaveholding, Henry declared, They'll free your 
It is a testament to how we have whitewashed U.S. history on the evils of slavery that Patrick Henry is far better known for his declaration before the Revolution, Give me liberty or give me death, than his equally pithy warning, They'll free your <laughs> Similarly, George Mason, Henry's collaborator in trying to scare Virginia's slaveholders into opposing the Constitution, is recalled as an instigator of the Bill of Rights rather than as a defender of slavery. A key so-called freedom that Henry and Mason fretted about was the freedom of plantation owners to possess other human beings as property. As historians Andrew Burstein and Nancy Eisenberg wrote in their 2010 book Madison and Jefferson, Henry and Mason argued that slavery, the source of Virginia's tremendous wealth, lay politically unprotected. Besides the worry about how the federal government might tax slave ownership, there was the fear that the president, as commander-in-chief, might quote-unquote federalize the state militias and emancipate the slaves. Though the anti-federalists lost the struggle to block ratification, they soon shifted into a strategy of redefining the federal powers contained in the Constitution with the goal of minimizing them, and thus preventing a strong federal government from emerging as a threat to slavery. In this early stage of the pre-Confederacy era, the worried slave owners turned to one of their own, Thomas Jefferson, the principal author of the Declaration of Independence, and a charismatic politician who had been in France during the drafting and ratification of the Constitution and the enactment of the Bill of Rights. Though Jefferson had criticized the new governing document, especially over its broad executive powers, he was not an outright opponent and thus was a perfect vehicle for seeking to limit the Constitution's reach. Even as George Washington's Secretary of State, Jefferson began organizing against the formation of the new government as it was being designed by the Federalists, especially Washington's energetic Treasury Secretary, Alexander Hamilton. The Federalists, who were the principal framers, understood the Constitution to grant the central government all necessary powers to provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. However, Jefferson and his fellow southern slaveholders were determined to limit those powers by reinterpreting what the Constitution allowed much more narrowly. Through the 1790s, Jefferson and his southern-based faction engaged in fierce partisan warfare against the Federalists, particularly Alexander Hamilton, but also John Adams, and implicitly George Washington. Jefferson opposed the Federalist program that sought to promote the country's development through everything from a national bank to a professional military to a system of roads and canals. As Jefferson's faction gained strength, it also pulled in James Madison, who in effect was drawn back into the slave interests of his fellow Virginians. Jefferson, with Madison's acquiescence, developed the extra-constitutional theories of state nullification of federal law and even the principle of secession. Historians Burstein and Eisenberg wrote in Madison and Jefferson that these two important founders must be understood as, first and foremost, politicians representing the interests of Virginia, where the two men lived nearby each other on plantations worked by African-American slaves, Jefferson at Monticello, and Madison at Montpelier. It is hard for most to think of Madison and Jefferson and admit that they were Virginians first and Americans second, Burstein and Eisenberg said, but this fact seems beyond dispute. Virginians felt they had to act to protect the interests of the Old Dominion, or else before long they would become marginalized by a northern-dominated economy. Virginians who thought in terms of the profit to be reaped in land were often reluctant to invest in manufacturing enterprises. The real tragedy is that they chose to speculate in slaves rather than in textile factories and iron works, and so as Virginians tied their fortunes to the land, they failed to extricate themselves from a way of life that was limited in outlook and produced only resistance to economic development. Because of political mistakes made by the Federalists, and Jefferson's success in betraying himself as an advocate of simple farmers, when he was really the avatar for the plantation owners, Jefferson and his Democratic Republicans prevailed in the election of 1800, clearing the way for a more constrained interpretation of the Constitution and a 24-year Virginia dynasty over the White House with Jefferson, Madison, and James Monroe, all slaveholders. By the time the Virginia dynasty ended, slavery had spread to newer states to the west and was more deeply entrenched than ever before. Indeed, not only was Virginia's agriculture tied to the institution of slavery,
but after the Constitution banned the importation of slaves in 1808, Virginia developed a new industry, the breeding of slaves for sale to new states in the West. The course to the Civil War was set, as ironically the warnings of Patrick Henry and George Mason proved prescient. The growing industrial strength of the North gave momentum to a movement for abolishing slavery. When Abraham Lincoln, the presidential candidate for the new anti-slavery Republican Party, won the 1860 election, southern slave states seceded from the Union, claiming they were defending the principle of states' rights, but really they were protecting the economic interests of slave owners. The South's bloody defeat in the Civil War finally ended slavery, and the North sought for several years to reconstruct the South as a place that would respect the rights of freed slaves. But the traditional white power structure soon reasserted itself, employing violence against blacks and the so-called carpetbaggers from the North. As white Southerners organized politically under the banner of the Democratic Party, which had defended slavery since its origins in Jefferson's plantation-based political faction, the North and the Republicans grew weary of trying to police the South. Soon, Southern whites were pushing blacks into a form of crypto-slavery through a combination of Jim Crow laws, white supremacist ideology, and Ku Klux Klan terror. Thus, the century after the Civil War could be designated the post-Confederate era of the American right. This restoration of the South's white power structure also coincided with the emergence of the North's robber barons, the likes of Cornelius Vanderbilt, Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, and J.P. Morgan, who amassed extraordinary wealth and used it to achieve political flout in favor of Lassie's fair economics. In that sense, the interests of the northern industrialists and the southern aristocracy dovetailed in a common opposition to any federal authority that might reflect the interests of the common man, either the white industrial workers of the north or the black sharecroppers of the south. However, Amid recurring financial calamities on Wall Street that drove many Americans into abject poverty, and with the disgraceful treatment of African Americans in the South, reform movements began to emerge in the early 20th century, reviving the founding ideal that the federal government should promote the general welfare. With the Great Depression of the 1930s, the grip of the aging robber barons and their descendants began to slip. Despite fierce opposition from the political right, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt enacted a series of reforms that increased regulation of the financial sector, protected the rights of unions, and created programs to lift millions of Americans out of poverty. After World War II, the federal government went even further, helping veterans get educated through the GI Bill, making mortgages affordable for new homes, connecting the nation through a system of modern highways, and investing in scientific research. Through these various reforms, the federal government not only advanced the general welfare, but in effect invented the great American middle class. As the nation's prosperity surged, attention also turned to addressing the shame of racial segregation. The Civil Rights Movement, led by remarkable leaders such as Martin Luther King Jr., and eventually embraced by Democratic presidents like John F. Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson, rallied popular support and the federal government finally moved against segregation across the South. Yet, reflecting the old-time pro-slavery concerns of Patrick Henry and George Mason, Southern white political leaders, fumed at this latest intrusion by the federal government against the principle of states' rights, i.e., the rights of the whites in Southern states to treat their coloreds as they saw fit. This white backlash to the federal activism against segregation became the energy driving the modern Republican Party, the smartest right-wingers of the post-World War II era understood this reality. On the need to keep blacks under white domination, urbane conservative William F. Buckley declared in 1957 that, quote, the white community in the South is entitled to take such measures as are necessary to prevail politically and culturally in areas in which it does not predominate numerically, unquote. Senator Barry Goldwater of Arizona who wrote the influential manifesto Conscience of a Conservative, realized in 1961 that for Republicans to gain national power, they would have to pick off Southern segregationists. Or, as Goldwater put it, the Republican Party had to go hunting where the ducks are. Then there was Richard Nixon's Southern strategy of using coded language to appeal to Southern whites and Ronald Reagan's launching of his 1980 national presidential campaign with a states' rights speech in Philadelphia, Mississippi, 
the notorious site of the murders of three civil rights workers, the two strands of historic conservatism, white supremacy and small government ideology, were again winding together. In New York Magazine, Frank Rich summed up this political history while noting how today's right-wing revisionists have tried to reposition their heroes by saying they opposed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 simply out of high-minded small government principles. But, Rich wrote, quote, the primacy of Strom Thurmond in the GOP's racial realignment is the most incriminating truth the right keeps trying to cover up. That's why the George W. Bush White House shoved Mississippi Senator Trent Lott out of his post as Senate Majority Leader in 2002, once news spread that Lott had told Thurmond's 100th birthday gathering that America wouldn't have had all these problems if the old Dixiecrat had been elected president in 1948. Laud, it soon became clear, had also lavished praise on Jefferson Davis and associated for decades with other far-right groups in thrall to the old Confederate cause, but the GOP elites didn't seem to mind until he committed the truly unpardonable sin of reminding America, if only for a moment, of the exact history his party most wanted and needed to suppress. Then he had to be shut down at once." Unquote. This unholy alliance between the racists and the corporatists continues to this day, with Republicans understanding that the votes of blacks, Hispanics, Asians, and other minorities must be suppressed if the twin goals of the two principal elements of the right are to control the future. That was the significance of this year's ruling by the Supreme Court's right-wing majority to gut the Voting Rights Act. Only if the votes of whites can be proportionately enhanced and the votes of minorities minimized can the Republican Party overcome the country's demographic changes and retain government power that will advance the interests of both the racists and the free marketeers. That's why Republican-controlled state houses engaged in aggressive gerrymandering of congressional districts in 2010 and tried to impose ballot security measures across the country in 2012. The crudity of those efforts clumsily justified as needed to prevent the virtually non-existent problem of in-person voter fraud was almost painful to watch. As Frank Rich noted, quote, Everyone knows these laws are in response to the rise of Barack Obama. It is also no coincidence that many of them were conceived and promoted by the American Legal Exchange Council, or ALEC, an activist outfit funded by heavy-hitting right-wing donors like Charles and David Koch. In another coincidence that the GOP would like to flush down the memory hole, the Koch's father, Fred, a founder of the radical John Burt Society in the 50s, was an advocate for the impeachment of Chief Justice Earl Warren in the aftermath of Brown v. Board of Education. Fred Koch wrote a screed of his own, accusing communists of inspiring the civil rights movement, unquote. Blaming the Democratic Party for ending segregation, and coyly invited by opportunistic Republicans like Nixon and Reagan to switch party allegiances, racist whites signed up with the Republican Party in droves. Thus the Democratic Party, which since the days of Jefferson had been the party of slavery and segregation, lost its southern base, ceding it to the Republican Party, which essentially renounced its historical legacy as the anti-slavery and anti-segregation party. This flip in the allegiance of America's white supremacists from Democrat to Republican also put them in the same political structure as the anti-regulatory business interests which had dominated the Republican Party from the days of the robber barons. These two groups again found themselves sharing a common interest, the desire to constrain the federal government's commitment to providing for the general welfare. To the corporate Republicans, this meant slashing taxes, eliminating regulations, and paring back social programs for the poor, or in Ayn Rand vernacular, the moochers. To the racist Republicans, this meant giving the states greater leeway to suppress the votes of minorities, and gutting programs that were seen as especially benefiting black and brown Americans, such as food stamps and health care reform. Thus, in today's neo-Confederate era, the American right is coalescing around two parallel ideological motives, continued racial resentment from the disproportionate number of black and brown people getting welfare to the presence of a black family in the White House, and resistance to government regulations from efforts to control Wall Street excesses to restrictions on global warming emissions, though the white racist element of this coalition might typically be expected to proudly adopt the stars and bars of the old Confederacy as its symbol. The modern right is too media-savvy to get boxed into that distasteful imagery of slavery.
So instead, the right has opted for a rebranding as revolutionary war-era patriots, calling themselves Tea Partiers, donning tricorner hats, and waving yellow banners with a coiled snake declaring, Don't tread on me. So instead of overtly defending the Confederacy, the right proclaims its commitment to the founding principles found in the Constitution. But this sly transformation required the right to rewrite the founding narrative, to blot out the initial interpretation of the Constitution by the Federalists, who after all were the ones who primarily crafted the document, and to pretend that Jefferson's revisionist view, representing the free Confederate position of the Southern plantation owners, was the original one. Now this doctrine history, hostile to any federal government actions that would promote the general welfare, is leading the United States and the world into an economic crisis.